everybody, and welcome to a Gem of a Secret podcast. My name is Donatella My Secrets. And my name is Coco Gem Holiday. Coco, how are you doing tonight? Um, I feel like Satan's ass crack is sitting on my face. It's so hot. I think we've already established that in a previous episode, and yeah, we just need to reiterate that it's fucking hot. It's so hot. Sorry to drop an F-bomb so early in the episode, but this heat, I don't understand it. Um, it's a whole different heat from uh, the dry heat, but you know what? This is my second summer of it, so I think if I could just like stand like maybe three as a charm, <laughs> I'll, I'll just be immune to it at that uh, point, and it won't affect me as and much. And I think I finally need to admit that I think that the heat is racist. Uh, um, we yeah. finally should call it out on its problematic behavior. <laughs> we need to dismantle the systems that make it exist, and yeah. we need to really like cool it down. We yeah. just have to cool it down. <laughs> yeah. What is the cooling down process involved? Lots of dry ice, lots of... Uh... <laughs> lots of um, call, uh, calling out your racist grandma, a yeah. lot of... Um, you know, air conditioners that function. Or maybe just, like, climate control. Maybe... Yeah, that's probably a thing. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe that. Maybe it's important to focus on making the environment better. I don't know. Well, we have to recycle and compost here. Oh, yeah, for all of our friends in Colorado, um, it's a requirement to recycle here. They only mm. pick up our trash every two weeks. Um, they pick up our compost and our recycling and our glass every week. Um, so you're kind of forced to recycle or you just end up with bags of trash. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And speaking of Colorado, that's actually where I was last week. That's why I wasn't here. Yeah. For the last week's episode. Yeah, we had a beautiful interview that we did last week with Matthew because I felt mm-hmm. super lonely. Um, did you listen to it? Mm-hmm. Oh, cool. What'd you think? I loved it. I thought it was extremely informative, and it's really good to get like a legal perspective on um, what's happening currently, and just to be more um, woke and aware about different in- uh, issues affecting uh, the trans community as well. Yeah. So I'm going to interview Adana this week because she was gone for one week. So I know nothing about her anymore. Our friendship has been a lie. I'm a stranger. I'm like, get out of my house. I came in, I came in wearing, (laughs) wearing a film noir, like 1930s get up. I had like a a, a hat and a trench coat on and I was acting completely different too. Yeah. And it was weird because it was Mm -hmm. super hot, but she just insisted on keeping the trench coat on. (laughs) Exactly. It was very swampy under there. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, tell me a little bit about the road trip. So how did you mm-hmm. actually end up in Grand Junction for so long? Uh, car trouble. <laughs> it was <laughs> Grand Junction was supposed to be a spot we passed through, not somewhere we stayed for four days. Um, because we were going to be basically primitive camping on uh, Bureau of Land Management land, because you can do that for up to 14 days. Oh, okay. Um, and especially if you buy like a certain pass to it, it helps you get into certain parks that have BLM land on it. Hmm. And um, so, yeah, we, we were just going to be doing that for the, the duration of the road trip. And we were supposed to be back on Thursday. But we crash landed in Grand Junction on, I believe, Tuesday, Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, that turned into staying an extra day because they had to build the part for Autumn's car. Autumn was the one that was driving. And uh, yeah, so they had to build the part. And then we found out our dear friend, Natalie Simone from uh Mm -hmm. originally from tennessee that area from she used to perform in the south um and then moved to grand junction she's kind of been the one that's been doing the shows there she had a show coming up and was like hey why don't you perform and i was like okay um well autumn was the one that made that decision because she was the driver so i was like okay like definitely would rather get out of here sooner than later but you know what i'm gonna spend time with my friend and it's gonna be fun that's really cool yeah so um You told me that you had a panic attack one day or Uh an anxiety attack. The first day. Um, Tell me about that. Um, I guess really when it comes down to it, I haven't really agreed with the way (laughs) that my family has kind of seen the state of the world currently. And um, the thing is, this trip was planned before I had kind of had some disagreements Mm -hmm. Um, with some of my family and, uh, there was, you know, a lunch that I went to and it just kind of, it was just, things like seemed a little bit tense just because I know that I definitely, when I had the conversation with one of my family members, I was very passionate and, um, it was just kind of a strange interaction and it just led me to think about a lot of things. I also just experienced a lot of trauma there and this time it was like being back there and being 
strictly with like friends and people who knew me as I was going through some of my struggles and stuff was overwhelming. And I also just didn't want a lot of people to know I was there because it wasn't a planned trip. Um, right. Yeah. But the anxiety definitely, I think it definitely had to do with the fact that I was in an area that I didn't feel like, I guess, my beliefs were really valued. Yeah. You know? And I think that was kind of telling that one of the days when we were uh, driving through, we drove through Montrose, and there was a big old, like, Trump and Republican senator rally that was happening um, in Montrose. So. Ooh. You know, and then we, of course, there was like a slew of Confederate flags that we saw while we were there. A lot of, a lot of support for the president. And to me, right now, it's just kind of unfathomable to support a man that is uh, so terrible. You know, it's interesting. Like, a lot of people from Portland keep telling me they're like, um, you know, if you drive like you know thirty miles out of Portland. Like, you're bound to see a Confederate flag. And I haven't seen one yet. Mm -hmm. And I am looking because I'm a, I'm sensitive to them. But, like, I feel like um, I haven't seen one since I moved here. And I've been here for over a year now. Mm -hmm. It's been an utter blessing. And when Donna was telling me her story about being in Grand Junction, I was just thinking the entire time, like, wow, I live in such a nice place now. <laughs> yeah, the energy there was just very different. It's it's weird being here, and I feel charged, and I feel ready to, like, face a revolution, and I, I felt that as soon as I got back here, you know? Like, I felt, like, ready to, you know, be a part of this cause and just show my support and be an ally in the best way I could. But it was, right. like, there, that energy, it's it's much more oppressive there. yeah. And, like, I feel like the conversations that happen there always have to have such a, um, there's, like, this uh, preface that you have to have. Like, you have to be like, okay, we're starting in a place of racism and we're mm -hmm. moving forward. But when I, I'm in Portland, I'm, like, it's usually starting at a place of, like, maybe misguided wokeness and moving yeah. forward. Like, it's so different. Um, so tell me about, um, what was it like doing drag? Since everybody knows it's, like, kind of a drag-related podcast. So. Yeah. Um, what was it like doing drag back in GJ? It was good. Um, it's kind of funny when you go to, like, your old stomping grounds and then you see some of the people that just haven't changed and are, you know, still, like, the, you know, the ones that are uh, indulging in a lot of drinks at the bar and mm -hmm. may not remember you. <laughs> Dang. But, you know, you remember them because they went to your shows all the time. And it's it's just kind of nice. It was nice to see that. I would say, that like, like, towards the end of the trip there, things were definitely great. Natalie gave me and Autumn two very gorgeous outfits and some shoes. And, um, yeah, we got to go home with some nice things that because Natalie is just a very giving person and does that. So it was nice. It was nice. The drag related stuff was all pretty good. You know, That's great. The show wasn't super popping, but it's also like their first thing that has happened since reopening. Right. Uh, bars and stuff for that. So. And there was only, like, 50% capacity anyway, so I think... Oh, I bet that was rough. Natalie had made it, like, invite only to just make sure that the people who, you know, really were going to enjoy the show were there. And, um, yeah, that was... It was nice. It was just... It was good to see some um, friendly faces. And uh, just to be on my old stomping grounds and to be with a really close friend, you know? Because I missed I missed Natalie a lot, and I missed the entire House of Simone. Um and, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. I think that when I think about Junction nowadays, um, I kind of feel a little guilty because I ragged on it so hard. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, the place itself isn't terrible. Like, it's beautiful, and it's a really wonderful... Like, the backdrop is just gorgeous. It yeah. really is. The backdrop is gorgeous. But I just had so many negative personal situations with people. And that mindset there that's, like, really uncomfortable, like, I... I, it makes it hard for me to like really miss it at the level to which other people might miss going back to their hometown. Cause I lived there for over a decade. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I lived there all my life and I found myself trying to really like prove to autumn that there was beauty and not just like a deserty kind of hot, uh, land of <laughs> people that are very, the, of some people yeah. that are closed-minded, you know, like I tried to, I tried to show as much of the beauty of the place as I could, and 
the sad thing is I felt like when I came down when it came down to it like there's just a lot more beauty here for me than there is in my hometown yeah and um that's okay and that's okay it just it just shows me that you know what that that was my third time in the span of a year um of being Mm. back there so I think it just shows that creating some distance from my hometown is okay too and uh yeah especially if it's gonna send me into an anxiety (laughs) anxiety attack being there you know do you have any advice do you have any advice for like people that like like drag artists Mm -hmm. or even lgbtq people who have to go home yeah or go home for holidays or things like that um what would be some advice you'd give boundaries set boundaries um if you don't feel comfortable with like seeing seeing um you know all the people that you used to be close with while you were there then you don't have to you don't have to let everyone know that you're there the experience is for you and you only yeah and um you should treat it as such so setting those boundaries you know that's important i also think that just coming back with an open heart and an open mind is a good good idea to come out of a place of love and realize that you know like it is nice to remember where you came from and it it doesn't have to all be revisiting trauma it doesn't have to all be remembering some of those hard times that it can also be a healing experience too to yeah. come back you know that reminds me donna i forgot to ask yeah how are you doing tonight you know what i'm doing you know what i'll let you know after this brief commercial break is what i'll do okay okay have you ever been drunk off your ass at a gay bar during a drag show and thought you know what? I can do that. I can too hard. Maybe if I control the yellow shots, I can have more for myself. Then have we got a show for you. Cooking Up a Queen. A brand new limited series brought to you by the CD Studios. Over the course of a 10-week run, you'll be brought into the flagrant and fanciful world of queer nightlife. With Camp One and Kiki finalist Coco Jim Holiday and rising star of the Portland drag scene, Touche Douche. These two will delve deep into what it takes to be a drag entertainer, the do's and don'ts of newcomers on the scene, as well as discuss topics that you would never think would come up until you're a cross-dresser on the corner of 5th and Broadway. Trust me, you're going to want to pay special attention for that one because, um, it's a lot. Make sure to tune in starting May 31st every Sunday for Cooking Up a Queen, available wherever you podcast. It's a podcast with Coco and Donna. Tell a podcast. Tune into what they tell you. Podcast with Coco and Donna. Tell a podcast. I am feeling very focused and very just in the mood to organize. I think that it's really important during this time when we have this momentum to get organized and have some common goals and come together and just really like I mean obviously as white people listen to the black voices that are in charge of these movements and and really part of these organizations that want to deliver some of this change that's going to occur and um, also just to focus on on uh, changes that are going to happen based off of the November election Um, I think right now is not the time for us as people and as a collective consciousness to panic, but it's time to come together. And um, I think we're doing that by hearing about a lot of these atrocities that are going around in our world. Yeah. So for this next part of the episode, we do want to talk about some current events and trigger warning slash a content warning. I know that some of these subjects can be very difficult. We also wanted to mention, because we live in a very woke city and so we have to, um, (laughs) Mm -hmm. The fact is, like, when we talk about certain subjects or certain people, it is not because we are deliberately leaving certain subjects and certain people out of the conversation. Mm -hmm. It's really just because we're trying to focus specifically. And we don't have, um, I mean, it's only really a half hour podcast. We can't talk about all the atrocities in the world in one day. So uh, bear with us a little bit when it comes to that. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Just know that there are many, many cases beyond the ones that we're going to talk about in this second half. Um, There was one that came to my attention actually yesterday when I was online, and that is the case of Elijah McLean, who uh, lived in Aurora, Colorado, actually, where... Yeah, where I'm from. Yeah, where Coco is from. And uh, Elijah was known for being a a very sweet, sensitive, introverted soul that um, 
just really brightened up a room as someone who who wasn't you know your your typical social butterfly of a person but had a very good heart and he was a very just a sweet sensitive guy and it just so happened that the night of his death or the night that he was put into uh, the ICU and in a coma he was walking from a store a convenience store to get his brother a tea and someone called him in as being suspicious he was wearing a mask at the time because Elijah was anemic and used face coverings to keep his face warm at the time so this person called him in as a suspicious character um, basically called him in for having suspicious behavior because he was listening to music and dancing and um, it ended in Elijah being put in a chokehold and the EMTs uh, sedating him with ketamine which led to Elijah having a heart attack on his way to the hospital and and being pronounced brain dead later on and taken off life support. So Donna had posted this on her Facebook that I'm going to read for you all and mind you this can be a little bit triggering but you have to remember this was a like from the way I've read the articles, it was like kind of a kooky such a little bit of weird kid and, you know, and so this, uh, these were some of his final words said, I can't breathe. I have my ID right here. My name is Elijah McLean. That's my house. I was just going home. I'm an introvert. I'm just different. That's all. I'm so sorry. I have no gun. I don't do that stuff. I don't do any fighting. Why are you attacking me? I don't even I don't even kill flies. I don't eat meat, but I don't judge people. I don't judge people who do eat meat. Forgive me. All I was trying to do was become better. I will do it. I will do anything. Sacrifice my identity. I'll do it. You are all phenomenal. You are beautiful and I love you. Try to forgive me. I am a mood Gemini. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Ow, that really hurt. You all are very strong. Teamwork makes the dream work. And then he begins to cry. Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to do that. I just can't breathe correctly. Uh, he proceeds to vomit from the pressure to his neck and to his chest. Um, when I first read that, um, I obviously was immediately heartbroken. And I think that what's really killing me inside about this specific story is that this is the story of where you almost want something to be wrong. You want you want it to be like, oh, yeah, he just robbed a grocery store. You want mm -hmm. it to be you want it to be something super negative. And it almost makes me understand kind of what white people do when they try to diminish these stories. I think all of us as human beings want to know something bad happened that resulted in another incredibly bad thing happen happening. And it's a gross way of trying to justify it. It is. It's a gross way of trying to justify it. But even for me, like when I was seeing this, I'm like hearing those words i'm like how how much and it's not even considered necessarily like racism in a moment i mean that because racism remember is a mindset that leads to certain systemic oppressions but like in a moment like hearing those things as a police officer or as a peacekeeper like i would have to be riddled with so much power mm -hmm. like so much power that a person who was truly sad um or going through something i could just blow past mm -hmm. like because i have all of the power and no matter what you say to me i am a bad person mm -hmm. and i'm going to do the things that i want to do yeah yeah and i don't want to make any assumptions about elijah or anything but there are um some articles that i've come across that said that you know he could have been um on the autism spectrum and that is just further proof that in a lot of these instances where police are called they don't know how to deal with someone who may have different quirks mm -hmm. and police aren't equipped to deal with people who who have those quirks no you know? and one of the things about the defund slash abolish the police movement is that so when you call 911 with abolish the police and defund the police um it's about getting you to a dispatcher that can help you with services mm -hmm. like so um i'm calling 911 because like i think that my mom is having a psychotic break Mm -hmm. Or I'm calling 911 because I'm feeling a little bit suicidal. Um, because police officers are not ha are not trained to handle either of those instances. And it always makes... 
we are expecting so much of them. And it's not saying that they get off the hook because of that. It's saying that the system is broken and abolishing or defunding the police will help change that system to help us get better services to where we need them. Because when you think about what police keepers would have done in this scenario, I'm pretty sure someone wouldn't have lost their life. Mm -mm. And regardless of those of you out there who might be following the story and you're like, well, it really wasn't like directly related to the what the police were doing. Even, even if that is true or even not true, the police handled, they were, they used a, a great amount of physical force. And the thing that makes me the most sad about this is that this very sweet, sensitive soul, this kid that literally went to animal shelters and played the violin for straight cats because they were lonely and deserved to have some comfort, he died a very scary, violent death, being shot up with a drug he was unfamiliar with and being manhandled having his neck pressed against you know like he his last moments were moments of fear and yeah. it just breaks my and heart it, knowing and it, that and a circ so there's a difference between i went to the store to get some ice cream and a drunk driver ran a red light and you know that's how someone's life ended because when you're walking home from getting an iced tea and the police just are upset because you're wearing a full mask covering mm -hmm. and you somebody and i did see in another article somebody did call the police because they saw a sp suspicious mm -hmm. looking black person i swear to god i feel like black people are more murdered for looking suspicious than they are for anything else i honestly i listened to the 911 call that came in and it was someone calling in a suspicious looking person and that's all it was i just don't even know like there's a difference between keeping your neighborhood safe and just assuming that all black people are immediately violent and dangerous. Mm -hmm. It actually brings us to our second point of this conversation, which we'll still be referring back to Elijah mm -hmm. um, throughout all of this. Um, so with Breonna Taylor, I saw that there was, and Breonna Taylor was, um, uh, she was the woman who was also murdered by police because of a no-knock warrant. And... Um, yeah, she was asleep at the time. Mm -hmm. And some people have tried to go back in her past and found out that she might have been involved in all these other really negative and deplorable things that people do when they need to justify why something happened. Mm -hmm. And um, so this brings me to the conversation of like black on black crime. And um, I wrote about this on my Facebook recently, and I'm not going to go into great detail about what it is, um, of what my Facebook status said. But the fact of the matter is black on black crime is a myth. Um, there's no such thing as crime like that. It's all just crime because like the majority of crime committed in, uh, towards a group of people is usually people done in their own community. Mm -hmm. Um, community crime is a thing, but it's not specifically based on race. Hate crimes sure are definitely a thing, but you know, when a black person murders another black person, he's not murdering them because they're black. No. Like, and most often when white people murder other white people, it's not because they're white. No. Um, so those things are myths. But you also have to remember these neighborhoods, um, like you have to remember what keeps kids out of gangs, what keeps them from being violent. And it's usually because there's no after school program because their schools are underfunded. Mm -hmm. They live in the projects. Their dads are in jail because they got picked up on smoking weed and they got like a long sentence leaving two moms sorry leaving a mom to work two jobs and then her kids don't have the ability to be looked after or sought after because we all know daycare is expensive so they end up in gangs and it just creates this cycle of violence mm -hmm. but even more to the point it's like it's it's a socioeconomic status like if you don't have the ability to have the resources to get ahead and you don't have those resources because cops are patrolling your neighborhoods every single night versus actually following real crimes then you just end up in a place to where you can't even succeed unless you try really hard. That phrase, you have to work twice as hard for half of what they have, it's a part of that. Yeah. Um, it really is. And so for all of our listeners out there, I want to mention, like, black-on-black -black crime does not exist. Don't use it. I'm sorry. The only time I ever see it used is to try and basically debunk the statistics that... Um, black people die at the hands of police more um, comparatively to white people. And mm -hmm. it's, it's always used as, as like a way to combat that, to be like, well, um, let's see, black people are killing each other, so why don't you focus on that issue? Well, there are organizations that do that. And mm -hmm. um, also, 
by saying that uh, black people are killing each other and there's just more violence in black communities, you're trying to put forward a narrative that black people are inherently more violent and up to mischief than white people, and that's racist. Yeah. that's It's, it's propping up systems of white supremacy to do that. It is. And there's also something to be said about when you push a label onto a person, they sometimes end up being that label because they're so tired of fighting it. Mm-hmm. Where people just accept that this is their fate and become the one thing that they didn't want to be in the first place. Mm-hmm. Because you're not giving them the opportunity to succeed. Mm-hmm. And like Donna said, there are a lot of groups focusing on, they're not called black on black crime in my neighborhoods. They're called community improvement programs mm-hmm. or community community enrichment programs stop the violence is one of them that's like yeah. a nationwide one so yeah th- there are programs that are that are doing that that are that are trying to help it but also we have to recognize that in many cases a lot of the instances in which um, black fathers specifically have been put away in jail is because they're serving minimum or mandatory minimums for lesser sentences and that's crime legislation that's just been enacted over time. And it's 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 things that we need to, as a society, dismantle and make better. And mm-hmm. so that's, you know, these protests are just... George Floyd may have been what tipped it over the edge, but it's so much more than that. And it's so much more than jo- George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, or Elijah McClain. It's all of the trans women of color that have died at the hands of violence. So, you know, there's there's all sorts of all sorts of things that are happening and all sorts of names that we can't all name because unfortunately there's just too many. There's way too many. And the other part of this conversation is that my mother-in-law recently posted something that was heartbreaking because the fact is like I I know that on a grand scale, we have difficult conversations on this podcast um, and we try to keep it light. We try to keep it funny. And then we try to talk about some serious things. But the one thing about this is we know that each and every single one of you has someone in your life that you care about who sometimes disagrees with the movement. Um, And me and Donna talk about this quite frequently, actually, because we try to get through to our friends and our family about different negative things that, you know, people say that could be considered problematic, but I mean, truly problematic. Like, Sure, there's like fighting somebody about saying all lives matter or whatever, but there's a difference between fighting your family when they think that black people are inherently violent. Yeah. Um. So like my mother-in-law posted- Because that's that, dismantling attitudes of racism and yes. white supremacy. And then when you say that, they're like, I'm not a white supremacist. How dare you call me a racist? I know. And it's so frustrating because mm-hmm. my mother-in-law, um, she d- did post online about a- a black guy who refused to join join a gang and then he was burned to death um and the meme end saying there was no march or protest for me but when you're black and murdered by other blacks your life doesn't matter um and that is completely um pushing the narrative that uh, black on black crime um is a thing and i think it's incredibly horrible um, and then it literally even says the fine print, uh, black lives matter only when killed by white people. And that is the most toxic thing to come so closely related to my life because these are supposed to be people who care about me, who want to amplify me. And Donna is going through the same things too. And the fact is like, I, I don't want everybody to sit there and argue with their mom and their dad or their mother-in-law or their brother or their sister or their boyfriend. But the fact is like, we do have to push these push the information out saying like this is where it's problematic but then it makes you feel so isolated because it's easy to talk to your friends in that echo chamber when you're just like oh yeah like that was terrible and they're like yeah it was terrible to when you're confronted with somebody that you care about being like i'm not a white supremacist Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but why is all lives matter so offensive i just don't get it and it's like, well, I'm trying to explain it to you, but all you want to do is be stuck in your Trump Defensive. voting ways. And it's the fragility. Just, it's the fragility. Oh, that the we fragility. All, mm-hmm, Gosh, dang we it. All, it's white fragility. It's it's honestly just fragility and not in, in them being like, oh, well, I've done my best not to see color. And that's, you know, a problematic statement in itself. But it's it's often those it's often those people and not even the people that just have racism kind of ingrained in them. Like you don't. Like, it, it, it could be someone who's completely well-meaning, as you were saying before. The fake woke, you know, all, all of that. 
but they're trying to use these talking points that are extremely damaging towards black communities and it's important like that we educate ourselves there are google docs full of in information for you to look at if you need to understand what this movement is about and if you need to really understand where um black voices are coming from when they're talking about this and the thing is those google docs that have been made have been done by some of the strongest and most vocal black leaders that are a part of this movement so i really implore you to take a look at some of those um, i may even pull a few of them up from twitter i know that they're posted on twitter a lot um, because that's kind of how we're getting our news nowadays so just yeah. stay informed understand what this movement is about and don't be bringing up rhetoric and language that is damaging towards these causes because if you really look at the root causes of it there are there's it, it just goes so much deeper it, it's it's an entire rabbit hole full of just systemic oppression that goes so much deeper than these few cases that we're hearing about yeah and it does and it does and i agree with donna and make sure you do your own research too once you um understand and learn something or you see something on facebook like that meme i mean honestly um or even the 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 thing that donna tella shared about elijah uh, she did go do the research to mm -hmm. make sure that's actually what was said she didn't just stare at me like oh yeah cops are bad no like please 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 honestly and i know this is going to sound counterproductive but like if you see something like that that hurts your heart verify that it's true yeah also look in the dates and the articles you guys are sharing yeah my goodness please don't be sharing misinformation in this day and age because it can be damaging it can every be. narrative you put out there especially if you're trying to put out there and convince people who are maybe fragile to like the information that they they get um it can it can change people's perspective and i know that i've said in the past that a facebook argument has never really changed my mind but I think that by getting to common ground with people and that by having these hard conversations, regardless of whatever medium it's through, you're doing some positive work. And it may take some time, but I truly believe that come after November, come 2021, we're going to see that as people, as the American people, we've been gooped by our people in power by our congress by our president and it's going to be when power is starting to be returned to the people and i'm starting to see that shift right now i really feel that a revolution is afoot and i think that collectively if we can organize and understand that the government has wronged us and wronged people of color very harshly in the past we can make efforts to change that and make our world better yeah, so please keep staying involved. Please keep sharing articles. That outrage you felt two days after George Floyd's death, keep that outrage, even if it's not as vocal. Like, share those articles, amplify people of color, amplify black voices, get involved, stay involved, stay woke completely. You know what Sarah Swedberg uh, said it was to me when mm. I was really in the thick of beginning to do activism? Mm. It was righteous fury. Righteous Fury. And I felt that after Pulse. And when I saw people sharing things about Paris, but not about Pulse after that happened, it was Righteous Fury. Oh my gosh, I was so mad about mm -hmm. that. Yeah. So mad. Oh gosh, it was so annoying. Yeah. So that Righteous Fury, that's something, it's something that we should keep up because it's the way things get accomplished. It's the way movements happen. So keep fighting the good fight. Yeah, so I think it's time for our Feed the Positive segment because me and Donna got tired standing on that soapbox. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> we love you listeners. We really do. Yeah. Make sure to also, like, if you really enjoy what we're doing, like, you can always leave a comment. Uh, we'd love to get into, like, a comment war on our website at a gem of a secret podcast.com because we post the episodes if anyone there. wants to debate us oh yeah i'm <laughs> about that come for me we could do a whole cross-examination debate where coco and i will be partners and if you have someone else that you want. oh my gosh i would super live for that now that we've learned how to do interviews oh my gosh yes i am down yeah um so our first feed the positive is going to be ursula major so ursula major the reason i'm calling her out is actually i'm being interviewed with her today actually as the release of this episode um, on her show as well. But the one thing about 
Ursula that I've always enjoyed. And by the way, she was on also Dracula. Uh, the thing about Ursula is she's the most down to earth, business savvy person I've ever met. Like she laughs and giggles in the way that I just really appreciate from any single person that I interact with. They have this ability about them to make everybody in the room feel like you're just as important, just as seen. And I remember one time I was like struggling with money and she was in Portland and like she like bought all my drinks throughout the evening. And That's yes, cool. I did equate to her like buying my drinks because I drink a lot. Um, <laughs> you can follow her on Instagram if you're not already following her on Instagram. Uh, I've <laughs> it's actually I fucked Ursula Major, but it's spelled I F V C K E D. Ursula Major, M-A-J-O-R, on Instagram. Yeah. And we're just going to keep up the whole alternative queen theme with our second Feed the Positive, because our second one is Sui Seidel, who is um, one of the queens who is very hip in the Portland scene. Uh, She is your reigning scream queen. And uh, Sue is really amazing in the fact that she... And I believe her mother uh, collaborate on making a lot of her outfits. Yes. Um, so she always has very well realized, fully constructed, co- fully constructed um, concepts for costumes when she's going into um, a show or a competition or a look. And I just want to give Sue some mad props for all of the work that she puts into her drag because it truly is. Um, awesome to look at when she has a fully realized creation that she's putting out there for everyone to see because Sue just really does pay attention to those details. And um, yeah, I, as someone who's also kind of in the alt drag scene, um, she definitely like takes the cake as far as like entertainers here that really like bring alternative drag to a whole different level. And you can follow Sue at... Oh yeah, it is feeling underscore S-U-E dot e dot s sorry p s y d o l l yes. so once again that's feeling underscore s u e dot e dot p s y d o l l there we go yeah also my butt crack is sweating yeah in this drag same. seriously like drag in portland is so hot <laughs> yeah because like we've reiterated in other episodes we're in full drag while we're recording this because we want to live our fantasy even if you can't see it. also like i can't do the voice if uh, if i'm not in drag so that's why i get in drag <laughs> get in drag just to have my donatella voice oh my gosh on on the podcast yeah yeah so once again everybody <laughs> um make sure to rate us on apple Podcasts. that helps us out a lot if you want to debate with us you can write us on our website we're also looking for more people to do commercials so if you visit our website at agendasecretpodcast.com you can click a link to like maybe have your commercial submitted to us and we'll go ahead and get that recorded up for you yeah and as far as commercials go it can be another podcast we're promoting it could be a show that you are wanting to promote whether it's digital or as things are reopening happening in the real world world um but yeah just write us a script or if you want to record it yourself and send it on in then we can do that too yeah so once again everybody my name is coco gem holiday and i am donna telling my secrets thank you for listening and we will see you next week bye bye everybody this has been another episode of a gem of a secret podcast the hosts of a gem of a secret podcast are donna telling my secrets and coco gem holiday you may follow Donatella My Secrets at Donatella underscore My Secrets on Instagram. You may follow Coco Gem Holiday at Coco Gem Holiday on Instagram. Original music by Touche Douche and Party Favors. You can follow them respectively at The Touche Douche and at Party Favors Music on Instagram. For more exclusive content, visit www.ajemofasecretpodcast.com. That is a J E M of a secret podcast.com. Be sure to tune in every week on Thursday for a new episode wherever you listen to podcasts. If you have any comments or questions, email us at a gem of a secret pod at gmail.com. Please don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>